Hello, everyone. Everyone can hear me? Okay. Welcome. Uh, thank you. It's uh, to the uh, kind of final hour of Brooklyn Book Fest. Um, it's been a great day. It's been very hot. Hope everybody went to some great panels and lots of books, including the Bookspire uh, authors today, who will be signing uh, afterwards, courtesy of uh, Greenlight, um, and uh, which you can buy just downstairs. Oh, there we go. No, just outside, actually. Um, so uh, my name is Ryan Chapman. I'm honored to be moderating this panel. Uh-oh. Hello? OK. Can everybody hear me? Yeah? OK, I'm just going to project. And I'm not going to be saying a whole lot, so this will be easy. Um, so um, my name is Ryan Chapman. I'm honored to be uh, moderating this panel with our incredible authors, Martin Amos and Dubravko Grasich. Um, and uh, I will quickly read their bios. They're going to do sh two short readings. We'll have a conversation. We'll talk about everything. And then we will have a short Q&A. And uh, it'll be great. OK. Um, so uh, Martin Amos is the author of two dozen books, including the novels The Zone of Interest, Money, The Information, and The Pregnant Widow, as well as 2018's The Rub of Time, which was published in March, I believe. Um, right? That sounds right. right. Um, and it's a collection of essays and reportage spanning 30 years. Um, he's twice been listed for the Booker Prize. Like uh, most novelists, he lives in Brooklyn. Um, though I understand you moved here from somewhere else. We'll get into that later, um, maybe. Uh, and um, uh, Dubrovka is the author of 13 books, including the novels The Museum of Unconditional Surrender, Baba Yaga Laid an Egg, and Fox, which was uh, published this spring from Open Letter Press. Um, she uh, <laughs> is also the author of um, the essay collection Karaoke Culture, which was a finalist for the Nas National Book Critics Circle Award in Nonfiction. Um, and she is here with American Fictionary, which I believe uh, is that technically comes out Tuesday, right? So this is like a nice sneak peek. Um, it's a uh, revised and updated edition of uh, work that Dubrovka published earlier. We'll get more into that soon. Um, she's been a finalist for the Man Booker International Prize. And in 2016, she received the Neustadt International Prize for her body of work. So let's welcome our authors. So I believe we'll start with our readings. Um, take it away. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Thank you all for coming on such a beautiful day. Um, I want to read something amusing. So there, in this book, there are only a few pieces that try to do that, um, or try to do nothing else but that. And they're all about tennis. Um, now, I could read a piece that, that is more in tune with um, our theme tonight, which is about my tennis career <laughs> and um, highs and lows. But um, the highs and lows disappeared, and then it turned into a downward slope. And I went from being uh, a competitive tennis player to being a very poor tennis player. But that's depressing. The, the, other, <laughs> the other tennis piece is about um, people called Tim. And it was um, inspired by Tim Henman, the British player, who never got anywhere, really, never won semi-final, I think. Um, and then I enlarge on this and say that no, no one called Tim has ever achieved anyone, anything at all. Um, and my first premonition that Trump might actually become president was when Hillary Clinton chose a Tim to be <laughs> vice president. Um, but this, this has nothing to do with our theme, and it's, it's, it's about a previous generation of tennis players, and it, it's just a couple of pages. Um, these appeared in the New Yorker many years ago. I have a problem with, I am uncomfortable with, the word personality and its plural as in, quote, modern tennis lacks personalities. And tennis needs a new star who is a genuine personality. 
But if from now on I can put personality between quotation marks and use it as an exact synonym of a seven-letter duosyllable starting with an A and ending with an E and also featuring in order of appearance a double S, a B, and a, 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 a double S, an H, an O, and an L, then personality and I are going to get along just fine. How come it is always the old personalities who lead complaints about the supposed scarcity of young personalities? Is it because it takes a personality to know a personality? No, because it takes a personality to like a personality. Ilya Nastasi was a serious personality, probably the most complete personality the game has ever seen. In his memoir, Days of Grace, Arthur Ashe, while acknowledging that Nastasi was an unforgettable personality, also recalls that Illy called him Negroni to his face and once nigger behind his back. Illy, of course, was known as a clown and a showman, i.e. as an embarrassing narcissist. Earlier this year, his untiring antics earned him a dismissal and a suspension as Rom Romania's Davis Cup captain. Illy is 47, but true personalities merely scoff at the passage of time. They just become even bigger personalities. Jimmy Connors, another total personality. Imagine the sepsis of helpless loathing he must have inspired in his opponents during his great runs at the US Open. There's Jimmy, what a personality, orchestrating mass sex with the grandstand court it's great for the mild-mannered Swede or Swiss up at the other end. He double faults and New York goes wild. Jimmy was such an out-and-out -out personality that he managed to get into a legal dispute with his own fan club. Remember how he used to wedge his racket between his legs with the handle protruding and mine the act of masturbation when a call went against him? That's a personality. Twenty odd years ago, I encountered Connors and Astasi at some PR nightmare in a Park Lane hotel. Someone asked these two bronzed and seersuckered personalities what they had been doing with themselves in London. Screwing each other, Nastasi said, and collapsed in Connors' arms. I was reminded of this incident when, last fall, I saw an account of a tour undertaken by John McEnroe and Andre Agassi. Questioned about their relationship, Agassi described it as completely sexual. Does such raillery inevitably come about when self-love encounters mutual admiration? Or is it part of a bonding ritual between personalities of the same peer group? Um, Arthur Ashe also reveals that McEnroe once called a middle-aged black linesman boy. With McEnroe gone, it falls to Agassiz to shoulder the flagstaff of the personalities. Agassiz, the, the, the Las Vegas traffic light, the Zen master, according to Barbara Streisand, used to smash 40 rackets a year. And I don't think he has the stomach for it, funnily enough. Nastasi, Connors, McEnroe, and Agassiz are personalities of descending magnitude and stamina. McEnroe at heart was more tremulous than vicious, and Agassiz shows telltale signs of generosity, even of sportsmanship. There is a demand for personalities, because that's the kind of age we're living in. Lever, Rosewall, Ash, these were dynamic and exemplary figures. They didn't need personality because they had character. Interestingly, too, there have never been any personalities in the women's game. What does this tell us? That being a personality is men's work or that it's boys' work? We do want our champions to be vi vivid. How about Pete Sampras then, so often found wanting in the personality department? According to the computer, Sampras is almost twice as good as anyone else in the sport. 
What form would his personality take? Strutting, fist clenching, loin thrashing. All great tennis players are vivid if great tennis is what you're interested in rather than something more tawdrily generalized. The hair-eyed Medvedev, the snake-eyed Courier, the droll and fiery Ivanisevich, the Wagnerian and Machiavellian Becker, the fanatical Michael Chang. These players demonstrate that it's perfectly possible to have or to contain a personality without being an asshole. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> I don't live um, in Brooklyn, but I am a novelist. Um, and it is not sad that I'm not going to open bakery one day in Brooklyn. Because in the meantime, I became an authority for bagels, donuts, and muffins. So I'm going to read a little piece, bagel. If I had to choose between a donut, a muffin, and a bagel. I'd always go for a bagel without a moment of hesitation. Although I admit there is something to be said for the donut. A donut is a small, ring shaped, deep fried bun, as Webster's Dictionary says. A donut is a cheap, simple, common American pastry. Variants on this simple fried dough, devoid of imagination, this dumpling with a hole, this amissable round bun had taken over dinners, diners, American supermarket freezers, and fast food stands. I admit there is something alluring to its plump, good na 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 naturedness, its wholesome color, and its simple pastry heart. To taste the real thing, go to a rural bakery. There you will see armies of swelling golden brown donuts boldly emerging. The essence of the donut is not only it, in its simple nature, but also its social, social, sociability, so, so sociability, sociability. Yes. A donut simply cannot be experienced in the singular because it hardly exists in the singular. A donut is always donuts. When donuts bought at the farm stand are put into a paper bag, the heady aroma of the cinnamon makes the customer giddy. At the same time, the bag must not be closed. The donut whose charm is, in any case, of brief duration, leaves an air. Lack of oxygen will transform it into an indifferent lump of barely digestible dough devoid of all appeal. What we can say about the muffin? Webster tell us it is a small, domed, quick bread made from eggs and flour baked in a mold and usually eaten while hot. I would say that the verbal satisfaction coming from pressing together the upper and lower lips to make the sound M, and then the slow rub of the upper teeth against the lower lip to make the sound of double F, it's all the muffin has to offer. <laughs> A muffin is an infantile form of mush, a hodgepodge. The muffin is a treat for the poor and the amateur. 
The muffin is not just simple, it's crude. It is a nothing simply by virtue of being an anything. The muffin has neither character nor consistency. The muffin shows a tendency to crumble. Besides, the quality of any food can be measured by a simple test. Can it be eaten on its own? Ask yourself that question in the case of the muffin and you'll immediately feel your mouth go dry. The muffin cries out for us to wash it down with tea or milk. The muffin has no personality. <laughs> the muffin is the zombie of breads. As I said at the outset, when choosing about donuts, muffins, and bagels, I'll definitely go for the bagel. A bagel isn't a treat. It's a thing and it's food. In the case of bagels, I do not agree with Webster, which describes it as a small, it isn't small at all, bread roll, roll, in a shape of donut, donut shaped. That's what Webster says, which of course implies that the donut is older than bagel. And that is a damn lie. <laughs> Not only do bagels have their own long Jewish tradition, but they have stylistic sub variants in many countries, especially Slavic. This cos cosmopolitan form of baked good is known as the bublica in Dalmatia, the bublik in Russia, jevrek in Macedonia and Bulgaria, and that's just the Slavic countries. A bagel is above all a ritual. On Sunday, you have to pop down to the little Jewish bakery and buy a decent quantity of bagels. A decent quantity, I say. Bagels also do not tolerate solitude. Then you have to cut them in half, spread them with the butter and on the top of the butter, like flower petals, scatter thin orange flakes of salmon. This is the classical, simple, elegant version. Tuna spread is good as well, and so in the lar laborer's salt of the earth version with fresh herring and the little rings of onion, such a morning bagel is unimaginable without the Sunday edition of the New York Times. <laughs> the fat Sunday edition must be spread over the table, place the bagels on the newspaper, the smell of the bread and the printer sink is important. Make plenty of crumbs as you eat, leave greasy fingerprints and let the interplay of the food and printed text determine the path of the reader's eye follows. The strength of the bagel lies in its consistency, its tangibility. Only a fool would hold the muffin in his hand, while a greasy, knobby do donut is tactical insult. A bagel with its smooth, taut crust, its firm, round body fits perfect into the curve of the palm. The bagel sits in the hand as if molded, molded to it in its natural bed. It is a divine disc. The bagel plays naturally with the hand. It fits naturally like a ring on a finger. The finger likes it and the bagel feels good too. The larger, drier, Slavo-Turkish version, the Jevrek, can be worn on the arm like a bracelet. The essence of bagel lies in the hole. 
the essence of the whole is visual. On Sundays, grab hold of a bagel and walk to Central Park, stop by the place where the roller skaters dance and bring the bagel to your eye. <laughs> I look at the scene through a little hole. If it is, it's too small, I hollow out the dough, enlarge the view. There is nothing odd about it. I'm peering through a bagel, so what? No one gets excited, and why should they? It's a question of optics, I say. The detail, not the whole. The whole is too big, optically indigestible. It doesn't fit in the eye. Doesn't reach the brain. A detail glides easily to the eye through the tunnel of the ruddy dough. In time to the music, a black tattooed forearm glides through the air, a muscle firm as an apple glides through the air. Eyeglasses in the black and white frame glide by, a broad green glides by, skates glide, a leg glides, a gold earring glides, looks glide. Nestled in my little circle, like a mouse in a cheese, I survey the world. No one can do anything to me. And when I get bored, I take the dough ring off my eye, alter the optics, fold myself up like a telescope. I wander through Central Park, nibbling my bagel, half for me, half for the birds. And that's why I always vote for the bagel. That's why I always prefer bagels to muffins and donuts. Long live the bagel. That to that blunder of eggs and dough, the worthless muffin. And for the donut, let it be. And I understand that you had some critics, uh, people who were muffin fanatics, <laughs> came back at you for this essay. Yeah, um, my, my nephew, he, he read for the first time anything of mine, and that was this, mm -hmm. a bagel piece, and... Oh, open your microphone. Oh, sorry. sorry. And he said, uh, he said, you should do something about that offense against muffin, because muffin is his favorite food. He's a Starbucks kid, so... Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Martin, any strong feelings about pastries? <laughs> um, I was never very keen on pastries, okay. um, and uh, uh, when my children eat donuts, I look on in horror. Um, but it's an American indulgence that I haven't really experimented with. Okay. Um, so, I, uh, looking at the books themselves, you know, the the panel is titled "The Passage of Time," which kind of means anything and nothing. So we're gonna cover a lot of ground. Um, but first I'd like to ask, you know, um, how these books came together for both of you because the stories behind them uh, are interesting. I mean, you're looking at 30 years of your own work and culling and uh, reordering and then Dubravka, you're essentially re revising, updating a work that originally appeared in 1993, 1994. Um, what was that process like for each of you? Well, you said every book has its own story. It's true. But um, it was very simple for me. Uh, it's like a, co a collection of short stories. You know, when you got enough, you do them. Mm -hmm. And um, I went through thinking, I, um, I better chuck some out just to show how I still got a sense of um, self-criticism, but um, I found that nearly all of them, agreeably surprised to see nearly all of them came up to a certain standard, mm -hmm. so I rejected 
very few. So I guess organized it and then. It's good. It shows a healthy self-esteem, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Dubravka? <laughs> I'm simply a lucky one because it is so rare that uh, authors in translation, translated authors, get a, a second chance. So, uh, and that came from my small publisher, uh, Open Letter Books, and, and the editor there who said that it is so, um, somehow he wanted to do a right thing because original title of this book was uh, American Fiction or American Fictionary. So um, somehow editors um, were confused with that fictionary word. And uh, um, for instance, in, um, in Netherlands, it appeared under the title Nationality None. But in England and in the uh, US appeared under the impossible title of Have a Nice Day from the Balkan, sorry. Have a nice day from the Balkan War to the American Dream. So that that was the editor's uh, idea, uh, because he claimed that nobody would understand the word um, uh, fictionary, American fictionary. So um, um, I was lucky, as I said. So this is the second edition. I did some revisions. I throw something out, I included something, and I wrote a postscriptum uh, after 25 years trying to remember what changed in the meantime and uh, to whom and what. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and I realized that this is the story that can't be told in a postscriptum, so more or less I left it the same, and I honestly admitted that uh, the book uh, is a risky one in that respect that um, who knows how it is going to be read. I hope uh, as, a, as a fresh one, <laughs> as a young one. <laughs> so we will see. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, it, the book certainly reads fresh in that, you know, your observations as um, someone who uh, uh, was traveling in Amsterdam and in the U.S. Um, and the early '90s, and then essentially forced into exile um, after the dis, you know, amongst and after the dissolution of uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, your um, reminiscences, your observations about um, uh, Eastern Europe and the way New York was changing feel very fresh. Um, for good reasons, and then for a lot of terrible reasons. I think that a lot of the nationalism and ethno-nationalism you remark on, uh, unfortunately, feels... It is still there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, have you seen, um, I mean, you're kind of back in New York and you've obviously uh, traveled quite extensively. Um, are you now seeing, um, well, let's, let's get to New York. Um, are you guys seeing changes in um, the city since, you know, the, the first visits in 93 or Martin and your time living here? Um, for good and for ill. I mean, I can only talk about bad things, but. Sorry, was that to me? Oh, sorry, to either of you. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. uh, I guess to, to put it succinctly, um, have you seen you know, New York change in your time here? It's, it's seven years in New York, is that right? Um, well, yeah, I mean, that um, blimp, who is now the president, um, and an amazing collapse of um, standards of discourse and I mean le the legal framework has stood up very well I think and it will probably destroy him um, or help destroy him but th th it's the human element I mean um, has anyone speculated ever that, that the great vulnerability of democracy is um, I know they did in the classical world that that the people are simply n well in this case they were capable of making a responsible choice but um, I th my theory is that a great do deal of stupefaction is being caused by the internet 
and uh, we know the effect on attention spans and and the passage of time has 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 really called into question whether they deserve a vote. Um, then that um, leaves us with a horrible dilemma. But but um, that has happened. I mean, Trump is one thing. The Republicans in Congress are another thing. And the third thing is the the people who um, pull the voting mechanism. Um, I mean, American friends say, you know, you can't go on saying how n nuts and stupid Americans are after Brexit. Um, and I, I sort of kept quiet for a few days, and then I, th then I said, yes, I can. Mm -hmm. the, the big difference between Brexit and Trump is that, no, as we're now seeing, no one had any idea whatever what Brexit was going to look like what it was going to feel like. Um, and we knew exactly what Trump was going to look like and feel like. Um, a, like a sort of terrible, bloated corn cob, very hairy corn cob, um, who, who couldn't um, manage a decorative sentence of more than four words and having got through, having scrapped his way through what, such a sentence, he then repeats it three or four times. Um, there was nothing surprising about that, and yet they voted for him anyway. Yeah, and no sense of humor either. And what? And no sense of humor. You're, you know, there's no the sense of humor. No honor. No shame. No intelligence. No application. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he's le néant, as Bismarck said of Russia. He's nothingness. Mm -hmm. Like you are talking about muffin, not about Trump. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, let's get back to muffins. <laughs> um, but this Forgive goes, me, yeah. I digress. Um, well, this goes back to, to, the, to the writing, right? There's the um, idea of how do you transform the capital H historical moment you're living within into uh, letters. You know, I, I know that there's this sentiment that um, with literature or fiction, there should be like a kind of interregnum period that the novels that uh, absorb or transmute 9-11 will appear five to ten years after 9-11. But uh, it seems as though with essays and short fiction that uh, the timeline is shorter. I mean, we, you know, in terms of the migration crisis, um, the October short story from The New Yorker in December 2015 uh, is, takes on the migration cri crisis square like squarely in the year when it was at its peak in terms of the like, you know, million people displaced um, around the world. It's, it's, not, it's not so much that you, you make predictions that are then instantly dismayed by events. It's more that the, the process takes um, several years. You can, you can, as I did, you can go to a Trump rally in Ohio and come back and write three, 4,000 words about it within a couple of weeks. Fiction doesn't work like that. It, it, its relationship to time is quite different. Um, fiction comes from the subconscious, not from the frontal brain. And it, an experience is particularly a sort of a life, you know, a, a life passage sort of experience like divorce or or, or indeed something like September the 11th um, does take that amount of time, three, four years minimum. And then, you know, there was a, a flurry of September the 11th novels in around 2005. Mm -hmm. And that is a, about right, that's how long it takes. So, y literature can't redress wrongs. Um, it's always gonna be half a decade behind events. And the essay can, and that's, for our purposes, that's the big difference. Do you see that, uh, Dubravka, with your own approach to fiction versus nonfiction, that uh, obviously the, the essays of American Fictionary were composed kind of in the moment of um, the uh, uh, dissolution of Yugoslavia, and then with a novel like Fox, I'm curious to how you 
um, kind of approach both um, because certainly that um, politics, the migration crisis also uh, runs as a sub-theme in Fox. No, I think that uh, I, at least for myself, I found a perfect forum and this is because I'm not a journalist. Uh, <clears throat> so, so I found a perfect um, genre, a perfect forum and this is essay. Uh, which I'm still uh, in the, you know, in the frame of literature, in the zone of literature, in literary field. Just um, um, essays, they serve for, a, let's say, daily or um, actual or uh, topical uh, themes, uh, the themes I'm concerned with or, or upset with and so. And for the novel, you need time. It's a, it's a construction work. I mean, it's a difficult work, so you need time. And uh, I, in, what concerns me, I think that I found a perfect balance, so in between novels and essays. And, mm -hmm. um, and in. Um one novel, one book of essays. <laughs> Do you switch off like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> More or less. Um, well, uh, yeah, there, uh, there's an element in American fiction. No, it's in Fox, the idea of the business class writer and the economy class writer. Um, you like that the best. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, which, yeah uh, Chad <laughs> talks about that. Because um, you find yourself like flying coach and then you know that like the, the you know, writer who sold a you know, million copies is flying first class. And you feel, I mean, there's, it's, Part of the great humor in um, Fox is this idea of the the economy class writer, you know, going to the festivals and um, being asked to speak at like at an experimental uh, Italian school where none of the kids like, well, they read, but um, you have an awkward moment with them that um, one hopes they learn something from. But um, do you? Uh, I don't know. I don't know how to phrase this in a form of a question, but um, since it is a book festival, do you have uh, tips for surviving as an economy writer at the uh, festivals around the world? Um. <laughs> you know what? I think that um, um, the best answer was given a long time ago, and I even wrote a piece about I fictionalized that uh, his thought. I mean. Um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez was asked why um, did he write and he said I write in order to be loved uh, and that was strikingly honest answer uh, we all want to be loved and this is fortunately or, or unfortunately uh, contemporary uh, reality festivals are uh, sort of places where writer of economy class too mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. can get uh, a bit of love uh, he longs for. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, the, the writer's life, you have to have a huge appetite for solitude. Um, although I haven't heard of a writer b being a writer be alone. I mean, you're alone anyway, I, I don't know. But, um, and then it divides into three. You have reading, writing, and living. Don't forget living. You have to do a bit of that. Um, and out of that comes uh, literature. Um, and as always, you need, it needs to marinate and it needs to um, be percolated through the subconscious. That seems to be how it's done. Mm -hmm. um, I know we're going to uh, open it up to questions very shortly. I just want to touch, I have like 10 topics that we're just going to rush through very fast. Um, no, we're not. Um, so dealer's choice, would you guys like to last talk about Nabokov, death, or more about politics? <laughs> no. no. Yeah. More about politics? <laughs> no. Um, Nabokov. Nabokov? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Dubrovka? 
Nabokov. Yeah, well, cause, uh, um, because we one over. of my things is that, um, that time is, is the sort of dirty little secret of modern fiction in that you know, Shakespeare, Dickens died at 58, Shakespeare at 54. And those are the senior citizens of, of, of literature because um, Jane Austen died at 41. Um, Emily Bronte at 39, mm -hmm. um, Byron 36, Shelley 29, Keats 25. Um, the idea of a writer losing his or her powers was absurd because they didn't even have time to amass their powers and assess them. Um, but now you have, you know, Herman Wouk um, writing a novel at the age of 98 and th that would all be great and you know no ageism here but um but the power to write a novel seems to start to decrease once you get to 70. the biblical span is about it and then then all sorts of things begin to go wrong john updike lost his ear um philip roth i think lost the power to infuse life into his characters. Very basic uh, thing. And Nabokov um, lost his sense of decorum about fiction. I mean, he is the writer with the highest strike rate known to me. He wrote 17 works of fiction and about 12 of them are masterpieces. But um, five of them are about 12 year old girls. Uh, and three of them are masterpieces, um, The Enchanter, Lolita, and Transparent Things. But that's a, that's a great sort of deformity on his corpus. The problem from hell? Yeah. yeah. Um, my other point about time is it delivers the only value judgment that you can trust. Um, all, most literary criticism, all reviewing, is really a rhetorical game where the critic uses his little battery of preference synonyms, whatever they may be, usually to do with, do, is he positive enough? You know, does he love life enough? But that's just what the critic likes. They're, they're not. They have no weight, those criticisms at all. But, but time does. And if you last two or three centuries, then you're probably some good. And that does mean that, um, that, and it keeps you honest, is that a writer never knows if they're any good. Uh, because not until five or six years after you die does time begin to give its verdict. Um, and it's, it's odd that all writers sort of disappear for five years after, uh, on the moment of death. And I asked my Spanish publisher about this. He said, uh, they have to go to purgatory first <laughs> to burn off their sins. And then they either sink or swim when they, when they reemerge. Um, but don't trust anything else. Um, so in hmm. 2218, one or two, well, in 2218, that's when we'll know if. American Fictionary and the Rub of Time hold up. Um, yeah, <laughs> century, about a century. Set your calendar. But would you yeah. say, because in my novel, Fox, I did this, this counting about the age of Russian writers. Russian writers. Russian mm -hmm. writers, Russian avant-garde writers. And they all died. Nobody of them lived more than a 50. I mean, writers of real value. I mean, they all died young. Some of them were executed by Stalin, okay? But would you say that it wouldn't matter anyway? They would die <laughs> with or without Stalin <laughs> um, uh, in the age of, let's say, 37, Pushkin died, many of them 37, and then up to uh, that Pilyak writer I was doing Folks about uh, 45, 44. Like a good girl. And even Zamyatin, who escaped, he wrote a letter to Stalin to let him go out, and he lived in Paris. Uh, 
for a couple of years and then died from um, while his friends were dying in concentration camps. Uh, he died of a uh, heart attack, young. Yeah, and Zamiatim is good. Zamiatim was good, right, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, that is very interesting terrain, mystical. Well, Stalin helped them along, didn't he, and Lenin. Oh, yeah. Um, and the only one he, he seemed not to ever mind much was Pasternak. Do not touch this cloud dweller, he said. Um, Stalin was a great reader, and um, that distinguishes him, as many other things do, from Hitler, in that he, he read what looks like the canon of, of French, English, and American writers, you know, serious reader. And Hitler read nothing but A, trash ethnology, racial stuff, and be the Westerns of the German lowbrow Karl May. Hmm. Um, and in fact, he gave every soldier in the Wehrmacht a copy of Karl May's um, Westerns. Um, and then I think a significant difference between the, the two. Um, we have time just for a couple questions. Um, if you have one, the way to know that you have a question is that it ends with a question mark. If you have a comment, please just tweet it into the ether, um, right up here. Sorry, I can't. Oh, yeah. 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 So for me, I mean, those two novels seem to take up years. Can you talk about that term? Well, I'll, I'll just repeat the question real quick in case you guys can hear in the back. The question was about um, Lionel Asbo and then um, following it up with the zone of interest and how that seemed to span like 30 years of writing and that there's a great breadth between the novels and how did that come about? Because Lionel Asbo is a sort of low life. British story and um, the zone of interest is set in Auschwitz and um, and I wouldn't I, I think this is a I shouldn't be having to say this but um, that all, all nearly all uh, writers in, uh, that are any good at all are funny um, Saul Bellow wrote a piece about this um, and in Germany, which is, of course, where m much of that second novel was set, um, they, had, they, they just dismissed the idea that a novel could be serious and funny at the same time. And I thought incredibly primitive uh, lit in literary critical terms. Because then, you know, that's the end of everything if you can't be both funny and serious. Um, but there was tremendous resistance to the idea that you could satirize um, uh, the, the Nazi ideology uh, while going on being serious. But um, I always think it's a, a blend and nothing I've written has been completely serious and nothing's been completely comic. Um, that this is this is how certainly how anglophone uh, fiction has always always been on on those two levels. I think it's different with German literature. Um, that novelist who who once you begin a novel of his, that's a single paragraph. The whole novel is just a wedge of prose. Every page, no paragraph breaks. I mean, that's saying this is serious. And in and France, French taste is um, is so weird in that uh, we all have most literatures have a few negationists um, who so alienated they can be barely get out of bed in the morning. Um, but D. H. Lawrence is a classic example in in English literature. 
But in, in France, that's the mainstream. They're all um, scowl, you know, roman de grimace, the scowl novel. Um, so it, it, does, it does show national character there more clearly than anything else does. More clearly even than a muffin. <laughs> <laughs> um, I th if there, is there one more question? We might be at time. Well, we have time for one more question? Okay. Does anyone have a question? Uh, yes, you sit in the front. So I'm 50 years old, and I've just started a debate program in fiction. Do you recommend that I go off and put myself right there? And you've just, you've just begun more. <laughs> can, can everybody hear him? No, you've got, you got a few useful years yet. <laughs> I'll, I'll, the question was, he's, this gentleman is starting an MFA program at age 50. Should he kill himself? Um, and how? If, if yes, how? Because, you know, the gladiator, thumbs up, thumbs down. But, but every generalization is, is, is um, full of exceptions. And you're not describing, you're not announcing an axiom. You're describing a tendency. And... Um, writers do tend to go off. Literary talent has not kept pace with medical science. <laughs> How could it? You know? But then he looks younger. Yes, he do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe 48. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what do you think, Dubravka? Sorry? What do you think? Go for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, go for it. Um, yeah. And my advice to anyone, young writer who's starting out, is when you've got some, a, a manuscript in front of you, get it done. And then you, if it's your first novel, then you'll go from worrying about yourself and am I talented, am I vulgar, am I thick, am I, you know, and you will go to worrying about what you have in front of you. And that, that you need to get it out. Then start to worry. A fine point to end on. Uh, I want to thank our authors for coming today and thank you all for coming. So, as I mentioned, you can buy their books and have them signed at the Greenlight Bookstore tent just outside the front steps. The signing's going to be downstairs in the rotunda. Oh, never mind. Signing is downstairs in the rotunda. We keep losing people. <laughs> Sorry. I'm here to bring you downstairs. Okay. Okay. You have to go.